Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us at the National Organization for Women's Now What? Building the Generations of Intersectional Feminists. As folks continue to join, we invite you to let us know in the chat box where you are joining us from. Just some basic housekeeping before we begin. We will be doing our best to keep the conversation to one hour. We will have a Q&A session towards the end of the hour and would love to hear from you all. So please type your questions for our panelists in the Q&A box and use the chat box for comments and reflections. Please understand that we try our very best to answer as many questions as possible as we balance our time together. With that, I would love to welcome our moderator, President Christian Nunez. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as I was kind of introduced, my name is Christian Nunez and I'm the president now. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight for Now What? Building Generations of Intersectional Feminists Part Two. After four, year, four long years of regressive and hate-filled politics and public discourse, 2021 is the beginning of a new era. One that is energized by a divorce, diverse coalition that came together to protect American democracy and fight back against bigotry and divisiveness. Grassroots activists and leaders have been on the ground for years laying the foundation for this historic presidential win in 2020 that sets us on a course to usher in a transformable change on women's rights. And now it's no stranger to moments like these. In our nearly 55 year history, we have faced head on the momentous task of putting forward our intersectional feminist agenda. It is at these moments that we must take time to reflect on our challenges and appreciate the community that we have built together. We are an organization that supports progressive values and has a deep commitment to diversity and equality. Our efficacy is conducted through an intersectional lens to ensure that we provide an inclusive and safe space in all that we do. For now, intersectional feminism means that every piece of legislation, policy, or program that we support must address marginalized, underserved, resource populations including Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and LGBTQIA communities. We seek to center the voices and the experiences in our work. And we can constantly look within our own movement and our organization to recognize and show how white privilege and white fragility may shape our beliefs and actions. As the second African-American president in this organization's history, the youngest person of color, and the youngest president in the more than 40 years, it is absolutely my priority to lead this organization through an intersectional lens, bringing together a diverse coalition of grassroots activists to work against the structural sexism and racism that exists. I am proud to stand on the shoulders of so many BIPOC leaders in the women's rights movement, including feminist icon and esteemed civil rights lawyer, Polly Murray, now first black woman president, Eileen Hernandez, and of course, the legendary Shirley Chisholm, a now member who became the first black woman to serve in the US House of Representatives and the first to run for president. But now has also faced our own internal struggles with racial division. We formed at a time when the women's rights and civil rights movements were often kept separate. Women from more privileged positions grew accustomed to being at the center of the, discuss of the, at the, center of the discussion, creating barriers to inclusivity and progress for BIPOC women and the LGBTQIA community. And while how we have seen marked improvements over the last 55 years, today we continue to work on creating an organization that provides a safe space for BIPOC women, trans and non-binary people to be heard as well. Through this work, many of those who, who were used to being at the center of the feminist discourse will now have to learn how to be an effective ally, an intersectional ally, and have to have difficult and often uncomfortable conversations. But we know you're in there for it. But I know that you're willing and able to pick up this task. Change is never easy. And that is why you must take these moments to reflect and appreciate the community we have built together and build on our progress. Tonight, we will take the time to talk about our year so far address the challenges we have tackled, celebrate our grassroots leaders, their victories, 
and discuss what we need to do to build a powerful and intersectional movement, movement going forward. And now I am so pleased and honored to introduce our wonderful panelists that are joining us here tonight. You heard her last week, and we are so proud and, ple and pleased to have her again to drop some more nuggets of wisdom. We have Heather Booth. Heather is one of the country's leading strategists for progressive issue campaigns. She started organizing in the civil rights and anti-Vietnam War and women's movements of the 1960s and was, a, and was the founder director and is now president of the Midwest Academy, which trains social change leaders and organizers. She was very active in the women's liberation and helped found the Chicago Women's Liberation Union. She also provided training for early NALS members in the 1970s and helped design early NAL campaigns. She was the field director for the 2017 campaign to stop the tax giveaways to millionaires and billionaires. And she directed progressive and senior outreaches for the Biden and Harris campaign. Welcome, Heather. Now, joining us later, we also have another candidate, um, another panelist coming on. And I'm going to go ahead and read her bio, and we will talk about her when she comes on later. And that's Hala Ayala. Hala Ayala is a Virginia State Delegate. Hala was elected to the House of Delegates in 2017 and currently represents the 51st District of the Commonwealth. She's the daughter of a Salvadorian and North African immigrant father and an Irish and Lebanese mother. She has worked as a cybersecurity specialist for over 20 years with the Department of Homeland Security and has also been a women's rights activist for over a decade. She was the president of Prince William County now and was appointed by a former Virginia governor, Terry McAuliffe, to serve on the Williams Women's Advisory Council. In the legislature, Halla helped to expand Medicaid for 400,000 Virginians and to pass the Equal Rights Amendment, making Virginia the 38th and final state needed to ratify the ERA in the US Constitution. Halla is currently running for Lieutenant Governor for Virginia. Next, I'd like to introduce Clarissa Richbloom. Clarissa is an at-large board member for NAL Oregon, where she's working with activists in local communities to advance NAL's core issues. She's been an advocate and organizer for most of her life, starting at the age of nine, holding honk for Obama signs on the street corner with her mom. Since then, she has worked for local campaigns in Vermont, Planned Parenthood, the feminist majority, and the Democratic Party of Wisconsin. In 2020, Clarissa began working at Free Will, a social venture on a mission to move $1 trillion into high impact nonprofits. She's incre incredibly passionate about women's issues, LGBTQIA issues, access to healthcare, access to education, and dismantling systematic racism. Thank you for joining us, Clar Clarissa. And next, I'd like to introduce our finalist panelist, Kristen Morley. Kristen Morley Herring. Kristen Herring is the daughter of a Welsh Dutch father and a Lumbee Scottish mother who grew up in the south suburbs of Chicago for 20 years before moving to Austin, Texas. She first became an advocate in her early childhood when she was taught of the discrimination her mother and other family members experienced facing for being lumpy and having brown skin in America. Kristen has been a caretaker for over 15 years from working with infants and children to dementia care. And she's been volunteering for Texas now for a year and a half. With the collected help of her team, Vice President Alexis Imuzi and a few board members, Kristen was able to successfully convene a new chapter in Texas called Austin Now. And as president, Kristen was able to lead her chapter more progressively with a focus of decolonization, which ultimately means coexisting and respecting sovereign nations and treaties or intersectionality fighting for liberty, equi equity and protecting all people and the mother earth. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Kristen. This is a wonderful panel and I'm so excited. So we're gonna dive right in. And this first question I have is for all of the panelists. During our last town hall, we listened to the personal stories of our activists and our activist leaders and what brought them to the progressive advocacy. We'd like to start this conversation off tonight, but just finding out a little bit more about you. Can you all share with us 
and the people on this call tonight your own personal story and tell us a little bit more about what led you into getting into this fight for equality. And I'm gonna start it off with Kristen. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so first I would like to acknowledge uh, that here in Austin, I am on Tonkawa, Sana, and Numunu lands. Um, just to give a little land acknowledgement. Um, and to answer your question, when your identity makes you a target, you're automatically part of the resistance. I'm a product of colonization, but the fact that I'm still here to claim my birthright to my Lumbee culture is resistance. As an indigenous woman, my existence is political resistance. The point of the indigenous genocide was to kill us all. The fact that I'm still here, the fact that 65,000 of my people are still here practicing our culture is resistance. So from birth, I was already in this movement, really. But then as I grew older, I started learning about the racism that my family members went through, that my friends go through even to the day. Um, as I got older, I was diagnosed with a pre-existing condition, which was life-saving, but I ended up not having insurance as a guarantee. I was only 10 years old, so that really um, affected me. And I was like, wow, this is the real world. This is really how it is. Like, not only does racism exist and not only do racists kill, um, there are a plethora of reasons to hate on people and to not give us rights. Um, my, every single person in my family, including myself, has dealt with gun violence. Um, um, my, I have a family member who is also part of the transgender community and my parents only had queer children. So like I said earlier, it really is when your identity makes you a target, you are just automatically part of the resistance. There is no unseeing what you experience. Sorry, <laughs> like try to keep it together. <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you. So I didn't really have an option. Um, a lot of things that I've experienced that my family has experienced is um, unfortunately, the American experience, and I would just like to be part of the resistance and actually help. So much, Kristen, and thank you for your authenticity in sharing uh, your experience and what led you into this fight. Um, I'm going to ask Heather to uh, share what your experience Before I start, I want to make one comment about George Floyd, and about what happened at the trial. Because it is actually fundamental to what, why we're here tonight and what NOW does. It means that a movement, not just a trial, but a movement over four years, over eight years, over 50 years and 200 years, a movement helped bring us to this point where there also is an elected official, Keith Ellison, who was the attorney general, who ensured that there was the prosecution that was connected to a movement. And with a movement, even when it seems almost impossible, the main lesson I've learned from my life is that with movement, you can change the world. And the movement and leadership on this call and in NOW is exactly what we need to change the world. Christian, we so appreciate your dynamic leadership. Uh, last week I was on with Bear Atwood, Vice President, how fabulous that was. And then these other remarkable women, I look forward to uh, seeing uh, Hala Ayala. I actually had supported her when she ran, so I'm <laughs> be nice to see her in person with the Virginia House of Delegates. Uh, and Clarissa, I thank you so much for serving NOW uh, at large on the board and from Oregon. And I understand you started organizing when you were nine years old. We'll hear more of your story. <laughs> um, 
and now helping to fund and support organizations like NOW. And Kristen, when I asked you, what did your t-shirt say? MMIW, I may be getting this right, but it was quite a lesson. It was missing and murdered indigenous women. We can never forget. I also wanted to thank part of team NOW who uh, brought us all together. Um, uh, Monique Alcala is an organizer's organizer. I met her uh, virtually during the Biden campaign and I'm so glad uh, her playing this role as chief of staff in NOW, uh, as well as uh, Megan Koskella, who's doing the tech tonight. We should remember all of those on screen, behind the screen, uh, those with credit, those without credit, uh, we are all in this together. For how I came into the, oh, and I, I also particularly wanna thank all of those of you who are watching this almost, uh, there's over a hundred people watching now, and this is the second in a series with hundreds watching and really thousands and thousands as part of NOW. You are the activists, the organizers, the people who are making the change that we need now. For me, um, I told some of this story last week when I was on. I started, there's a number of ways I started, but one way to say, it's sometimes hard to say, when does it start? Um, but I came into the civil rights movement and uh, in 1960, uh, in support of the demonstrations against Woolworths, which wouldn't let African-Americans sit at their lunch counters in the South. In 1964, I joined the Freedom Summer Project with a Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Mississippi. And behind me is a picture, if you can see it, is me at 18 years old with a guitar. And I'm at Fannie Lou Hamer's house, who is one of the great heroines of the civil rights movement uh, in Ruleville, Mississippi, which was the first stop. And in situations that we just felt would be so full of terror that it almost seemed like you could not make change but within a year, we had a Voting Rights Act. And the deep lesson I learned is that if you organize, you can change the world. I'll say just two more things that tie into uh, NOW and, um, and my involvement in the women's movement. When I came back to my campus, a friend of mine had been raped at knife point at her bed, in her bed in off-campus housing. We went with her to student health to get a gynecological exam and was told that student health didn't cover a gynecological exam. And she was given a lecture on her promiscuity. It seems impossible to believe, but we sat with her. And because people organized, you say now, of course women can get a gynecological exam from student health. Of course you're given supportive counseling, but it only happens when we organize. And I found NOW in 1970, when there was the women's strike and the theme of the strike was don't iron while the strike is hot. And I decided to connect with them. I had already been in the uh, Chicago Women's Liberation Union and we joined forces and have been together for almost 50 years. I'm still a member of NOW. Thank you all for what you do. Thank you so much, Heather. And you know, your contribution to, to now and the work that you've done has really been so instrumental. And we just thank you for your continued commitment as well. Uh, can I get Clarissa? Look, Clarissa, can you share with us what brought you to get involved and continue in the fight for equality? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> it's a true honor and privilege to, to be here tonight and with all of you. And um, just on this panel with these, uh, these fellow panelists is just absolutely incredible. So thank you for having me. Um, you know, why, why I got involved from a really young age, uh, I care deeply about women's issues. I, my grandmother um, was diagnosed with cancer before I was born and she wasn't given much time to live, um, but she lived till I was nine and we were incredibly close and I wanted to be just like her when I grew up. And she was incredibly involved in the women's movement uh, in fighting for women's equality. And so that, you know, got me interested. And, you know, as I went through life, I just really kept seeing things that weren't fair. Situations that, that I was in because of privilege and because of opportunity. Um, and, and that 
you know, people didn't have the same access simply because of identities they held or the situations they were born into. And that just didn't seem fair to me. Um, I have to, I have to say, I said it before everyone joined, but Heather Booth is an absolute role model of mine. It's really wild to be on a panel with her. Um, and I, sorry if I misquote you here, Heather, but at one point um, you said that to be an organizer, you have to love people and hate injustice. And that was something that I think just completely summarized uh, me growing up, um, me to this day. And it's the reason that I've continued to be involved looked for opportunities to be involved uh, throughout my life and uh, you know, is, is the reason that I'll stay involved. I do wanna say one thing because Clarissa was so generous in her comments just now. My great, my gratitude at this time is that you, Clarissa, Kristen, Christian, Bayer and others, there's another generation coming on I first became active when I was a young teenager. I was probably 13 or 14. I'm now 75. I'm still active. I appreciate your even inviting me in to say I have something to connect with you on, but it's you who will make the future change. So I'm really grateful for what you've done and will do and what we can do together. I also wanted to you, you made me think of one thing when you said, um, I have said, there's a movie on my life in organizing called Heather Booth Changing the World. You can see it online. Uh, you can see everything online, I guess. Um, and uh, it's the story of organizing. It's my story of organizing. And um, I say that quote in the film, so that is where you probably heard it. But I wanted to, it made me think of something else. When I was in the Biden campaign, and as Christian said, I had been the uh, director of progressive outreach uh, and seniors outreach for the campaign. You can still see my, my Bidens. I've decided, go, 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 the movement, we are moving on. <laughs> I want this to be successful. Um, but I made two buttons for a large core of volunteers that we had in our unit. And the two buttons, one says, love at the center and the other says organize and it's the same point that you were making clarissa and they're sort of my watchwords. thank you so much i think there were some great points that were made um clarissa saying loving people and organizing and heather saying that and also what kristen said about being part of resistance and born into the resistance. Um, and I th think what we've seen in the past year is that the grassroots movement leaders have been the ones on the ground um, who, who really were truly responsible for this historic presidential win we've seen in 2020 and set the course for this transformational change, transformational change we've been seeing. But we've also seen now um, this inflamed conservative rash of discriminatory and repressive laws that have been passed at state and local levels, including a lot of voter suppression bills, anti-trans bills, um, bills that have been targeting um, repressing reproductive rights and the, the body autonomy for women. Can you each share with me when we see this, we see this wonderful transform transformational change and victory, and now we're seeing this attack. Uh, and voter suppression and attack on our, our autonomy and rights. Can you each share with us some thoughts you have about how do we continue to move forward and how do we strengthen our moment and the time when we're seeing so many of our rights attacked and, um, and currently um, just being truly attacked um, under these laws? Um, and I'm gonna start with Kristen. I don't know, I think I started with Kristen last time. I'm gonna start with Clarissa this time. I'm gonna mix it up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Um, yeah, definitely. And I, I think, you know, to your point of of winning this historic election and and the work that was done and the groundwork there to do so, you know, something that I saw as a field organizer in Wisconsin, I was there for the whole 2020 calendar year, and um, and you know, volunteers save this world. Like again and again, people giving their time and their energy 
you know, I, I was a field organizer, but, and we had great success in Wisconsin. We flipped Wisconsin blue. It was very exciting, but that was because of the volunteers and the people that had been there and been volunteering for elections in the past and were ready and able to do whatever it is they could. Um, and I think that getting involved at every level, um, something I'm really passionate about is local representation. And I think, you know, in this past year, we've really seen how much who we elect at a local level matters because school boards across the country were making decisions about, you know, in-person learning or hybrid learning or virtual learning. And, you know, where I was in Wisconsin, COVID wasn't real apparently. And, um, you know, we, we know how much it matters who we elect in every election. And so finding that fire and that fight for every election whether it's school board uh, to you know, the president of the United States is really important. And I think especially in light of the kind of, as you described this, you know, very angry conservative far right you know, movement that's going on. Um, I think it's really important to use our voice even more if we can. There are so many people that those conservatives are specifically going after. And some of us have the luxury, the privilege to be able to walk down the street, to be able to call things out uh, and, and to be able to have those conversations safely. And I think it's our responsibility to do so if we're able to. Uh, you know, the, the, the volunteers that really always, you know, brought me to tears and got me going, especially given the pandemic, were the people that were there to volunteer for their loved ones that couldn't, right? Their loved one was a nurse. And so she was working extra shifts and just in the hospital around the clock, right? The people whose lives would really be changed by the outcome of the election, but due to circumstances, they couldn't necessarily be, be as involved as, as they wanted to be. And so for those of us that can be, to really make sure we're involved at every level uh, and, and doing what we can. 2022 is around the corner. So get involved now. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you so much. We just got uh, joined by uh, Delegate Hala Ayala. Hala, thank you for joining us. We're happy to have you. Um, and it is perfect timing. What we are, um, are talking about is just kind of what's been happening over 2020 and how we saw such historic and how our grassroots leaders were so historic in leading to the victory in 2020. But we also have seen a rash of, um, of reaction of, from conservatives that have sent out a lot of voter suppression laws and just restrictions of attacking ourselves in state and local levels and laws um, from reproductive laws and tax on our bodily autonomy to, um, you know, anti-LGBTQIA and anti-trans and um, voter suppression. And we're talking about what can we do to continue to encourage everyone to keep moving forward um, as well as to stay in this fight. So perfect timing for you to uh, jump in with us and share your perspective. And uh, we just welcome you in the space of us. Thank you for having me. And I, I can't tell you how excited I am to be with you today. Um, you know, we've seen, if I, I'll take a few steps back. Um, you know, we thought, I think we got a little complacent after Obama, right? We thought we were in a safe space. We thought, you know, he is going to, um, you know, protect us. And he did, right? He's offered these protections and advanced us light years, right? You know, just peeling back Jim Crow, peeling back discriminatory practice, et cetera. It was the floor, not the ceiling, right? Let's, let, I'm not gonna, you know, you know, just overstate that. Uh, but it was progress, right? You know, Bush before him and now, you know, Obama. And fast forward it to 2016 when these elections were happening. Uh, you know, Donald Trump, you know, his, his playbook was the rhetoric of hate, discontent, attack, dismantle any systems that were put in place by Obama and any right to choose um, uh, policies. He wanted to overturn Roe, he wanted to overturn LGBTQ marriage, 
He attacked our DACA students. He attacked our immigrant community, putting us in cages. He attacked our black brown sisters, our black children, you know, inciting hate. You know, you look at Charlottesville here in Virginia when we saw, you know, the, what, what was happening there. And then it just kept escalating. And then every day, if it wasn't attacking an issue related to reproductive health or voting or anything else, he was attacking, attacking, you know, um, the, the democracy as a whole, you know, standing on stages with oligarchs, oligarchs. Orlegogs, what you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I can't think today because today uh, Virginia just signed into legalization of marijuana, so I'm kind of just kind of blah, blah, if you will. But you know, he was standing on stages with people that were, you know, regimes that were were surrounded and 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 encompassed in all of these dis discontent and hate and everything we're trying to fight. The one thing. And I think I heard Clarissa, you know, uh, talk about that was elections, right? This is where it starts, your state, your local. You wouldn't believe local officials and ordinances when we're talking about protecting a right to choose, trap laws, you know, making sure, that, you know, we're, we're abiding by Roe v. Wade, all the way up to your state legislature who are going to produce laws and legislation based off the constitution and federal federal laws right that have been enacted and things we need to do to reinforce this is uh, you know not only a trickle down effect but it matters who you put in this seat you know 2020 you know just here in virginia you know well 2017 we made history right we changed the game of politics we helped gain back the united states uh, congress congress and and now today senate we changed the game right women came fighting for a seat at the table. So we were not on the menu. We were not going to be back. I'm, I'm the first national security slash Afro-Latina woman to be elected to the state house. And we wanted to make sure equity on all levels of government were, were, were going to be reinstated. Um, we are a trifecta here in Virginia where this means we have both house and state Senate and the, the, the governor, Lieutenant Governor and AG who are all Democrats. I've not seen a republic fight a republican fight for reproductive health yet you know i have not seen them try to support voting rights right removing ba barriers from the ballot box i have not seen them support lgbtq uh, any policy um or discriminatory practices to remove them in fact they have been uh doubled down on making sure that they take away all the progresses we've made not only here in virginia and other states like we've seen georgia so again, elections matter, and I'm preaching to the choir, Ray Christian, and organizations like Now Matter. And I wanna tell you, this is where I got my start as a Now sister here in Virginia. And it was leadership like Christian and, and, and Bear and so many others who have just mentored me and being so ever educated and aware about the steps we need to take and fight Right. If you don't run for office, you don't grab your clipboard and sneakers and run for office, be part of this phenomenal organization that is uplifting our voices and on all levels of government, give you the tools you need to be the greatest advocate possible. And I'm not just saying this as lip service. I'm a product because of their work. They've empowered me to go to the state legislature and pass the Equal Rights Amendment. This is the work that now will do. So, um, you know, I. If we can pop into the chat box or just tell you what your web now.org, you know, be a member, be part of a chapter, be part of a movement that will um, be part of the advocacy to protect each and every part of these laws. And um, uh, so that we are, you know, just really, it takes a village, you know, with anything that we do in the state legislature. And I'm speaking that as an advocate who's crossed over to the state legislature. Um, we can't do it alone. So this is the importance of the work that you do. I know that was a long answer, Christian, and I'm sorry. I'm just passionate about it. Please get off the sidelines. Sign up for now. I, I you know, <laughs> I'm no, your cheerleader. <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we need to hear from everyone is their passion and their authenticity. So we, we love passionate and authentic answers. I'm going to turn it over to Christian. Christian, can you share with us your take and then your perspective? Sure. Yeah. So, um, 
personally, I feel like we must, must, must reach out to other organizations and other activists and get them to join us and maybe we join them like we don't have to be just in one organization you know what i mean um and make sure that we um are paying attention to the legislation so like right now we've got um a few like really bad bills and austin now has partnered with texas menstrual coalition to combat like uh hb321 uh, we're trying to get period products, um, have the luxury tax taken off of period products. So there's, oh man, there's a lot that we have to do here in Texas, but um, I just feel like really our grassroots um, is our strongest, um, uh, oh God, what's the word? It's, it's, our, it's our strongest value that we have. Um, and it's really important that we just connect to people. And then we just connect to other people. If we know that there's, we have what, one, two, we have four anti-trans bills being pushed in our legislation right now. Some like some of the most disgusting things. Can I just read some of this to you? It's like, it is unbelievable. So one of our bills says to prevent healthcare workers from doing gender confirming care like hormones or surgery, which is supposed to help with gender dys uh, dysmorphia. Uh, I, I guess they don't care. Uh, another bill uh, revokes the licenses of healthcare professionals who do gender affirming care. Uh, and these are for patients under 18. Uh, we have another bill where school students, students, children, okay? This is all against children. Where they cannot do a sport. They cannot, they cannot play in a sport unless it is the gender that they were assigned to at birth. And then parents will be called child abusers for giving their children gender affirming care. It's just, it's outrageous. So sorry, it's just like, I can't believe it. I mean, I can, but it's just like, it's insanity. But um, so Austin now, we are reaching out to other organizations who are specifically trans-focused and trans-specific and making sure that they know that we care about them and that we will fight to, uh, fight to end these bills and that we will be with them and that they are not alone. Like we, solidarity is the, the biggest strength that we have. So really just reaching out and making sure that we talk to people. And, and we know who's who's on target. Kristen, and, and, and I think that you brought up a great point about being in solidarity, but not just being in solidarity, but letting organizations who are, who live those narratives and also experience those narratives sometimes lead. And while we're, while we're in standing in solidarity with them, I think it's very important to when we are working in coalition about causes that we're fighting for, because that's very important when we're doing, the, doing this work. So thank you so much, Kristen. And Heather, can you share with us what you recommend and how you feel that we can also um, work and continue to uh, keep moving forward and strengthen our movement? By the way, before I comment, um, and I love those answers uh, that every that everyone gave. I say, a women to that. Uh, uh, and and delegate Ayala, I think it was a supporter of yours. I also wanted to thank you for helping to pass Medicaid expansion in Virginia for four hundred thousand families. I thank you so much. I mean, this is saving women's lives. It's saving people's lives, and it's reflecting uh, the robust democracy we need. On the question of what do we do now at this period, I actually think that we are in a change moment, a rare change moment. For four years, we have had a level of hate and vindictiveness spewing out nationally and infecting around the country. And so we rose up in beautiful resistance. I have my pussy hat <laughs> and then we not all, we know not all pussies are pink and not all women are pussies, but however, we know that uh, there has been, since the Women's March, there has been a resistance 
We've known we need to stand up and protest. But there's more that's needed now. We need really to, to move from resistance, standing up and protesting. I love those NOW rounds and that says, no, <laughs> don't do this. Not with my body, not with their body. And now we need to move to deeper organizing and sustained campaigns around the issues that are most important to women's lives, most important to people's lives. Nationally, we have a chance on it, whether it's ensuring that there's true vaccination and funding for it with the um, rescue package, or whether it's a jobs package, or whether it's a tax package so we can pay for it. All of these are women's issues. And each of these issues are also reflected at the state level. We're in this moment where uh, in the last election, Biden got a historic 80 million votes, historic. Trump got a historic 74 million votes and nearly one third of the population who could have voted did not vote. This is a standoff that cannot be sustained just by skimming off those who are already in support, just by showing up and saying, we are right and enough that we need to continue doing that. We need to also organize. And that means outreach, moving more in, in what districts, in what areas. So we have whole states, we have many districts, and we have a whole country. And then driving that through uh, the campaigns until we can win. That's what I know that Kristen is doing, Clarissa is doing, Delegate Ayala is doing, and Christian, you and NOW lead us in that direction. She's my spirit animal. That's all I got to say. Go, girl. <laughs> you go, Heather. You go. You know, Heather, Heather, I said hello earlier. I had to be dropping those nuggets for us. <laughs> can I just make Wait, a little, can I just, spirit animal, yes, can I yes, do that? No, no. <laughs> No, I mean, she's a kindred spirit because that beautiful spirit and just, you know, it's just, it's beautiful. We need yes. to put that to tape and put that on the website. <laughs> yes. That is amazing. Fired up and ready to go. One of the things I think, Heather, you really hit on, I think is so important. Um, and I think this will tie into our next couple of questions is it's about having sustained campaigns that are important issues and to the lives of women, you know? And, and I think this speaks as it has resonates so, so much with me and these campaigns we're, we're dealing with right now, economic justice, reproductive justice, racial justice, um, you know, equality for women's rights, the right to vote, all these things are, these, these campaigns, you know, um, making sure women have a living wage, you know, Making sure we have a right to, uh, you know, healthcare, uh, paid family need. Look, there's so many things that are going on. These sustained campaigns need to take place, um, and they have to be inclusive. You know, um, so this kind of brings me into my next question. For a long time, the voices of Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian, trans, non-binary voices have been left out of such critical discourse and left out of a lot of our legislation. It hasn't been written for these voices, but we are committed to building an intersectional movement here and now, right? So what are your thoughts on how we ensure that these voices of historically marginalized communities are now centered in the work that we're doing? So I'm gonna start this off with Hala. I'm gonna start you off with you again, cause you kind of came in and I'm gonna bring you back into loop for us. You know, I think you know, after we saw, I'm still grappling yesterday with George Floyd, yes. I'm an Afro Latina with two black children who every day walk out of my home and I have to, there's two sets of rules for us. There is one set for one group of individuals and another set for us. And we've seen this, this is not just misnomer or, you know, just made up in my head. This is reality for decades. And when my children walk out, you know, whether it's to exercise or go to work or working or drive a car, you know, I worry about my children. And I think yesterday was, a, a, you know, just one step 
it's not, it was the floor, not the ceiling of accountability. Um, it wasn't full realized justice because justice, it shouldn't have happened, right? You know, and these are systemic through all of our systems. But I think this is where representation matters, right? Diversity and diversity of voices matter on all levels of government because we are, we're the lawmakers, right? And we're the change makers, right? And, and we are the ones that can, in Virginia, 26 years of Republican rule that has attacked women's reproductive health, our black and brown communities, voting rights, all of these things. This is not made up folks, this is the reality. And I think the way we change that is elections. If you can't change their mind, you change their seats. That's it. End of sentence. Period. Right? You if if it if you can't change their hearts and their thoughts, you've got a you you've got the power of the ballot box. Um, and we must be able to protect every part of that democracy. The advocacy they that now does in partnership with other organizations and constantly engaging our lawmakers and you know, bringing up and lifting up other voices of, of, of women and men to not only provide education, but this, the organizing, the, the advocacy and things that we, got, we have to do must, I agree with Heather, has to be a con consistent flow, right? This can be never ending. We have to, we, you know, because people say, I, I'm not involved in politics or these issues. That doesn't mean you're not being, you know, guided by them or, or they don't impact you. Um, and it takes a village, right? Again, Christian, the work that now has done over decades for me to pass the Equal Rights Amendment, making Virginia the 38th state, and I'm just gonna use this as an analogy, not a, not a look at me thing. It took the work of our sisters and brothers in marginalized communities to sacrifice, to march, to knock on doors, to elections, to, to all the way up to the president, to presidency for this to happen. Women died, they were force fed, they were raped, they were murdered, you know, all of these things just for the right to the ballot box and access to it. And if, you know, and if you were a black and brown person, you did not get access to it till 1965. And if you were a different language speaker, it wasn't until 1975. The reality is this is not going to be in, undone in one election. This is hope. This is a start, um, not the finish. So again, I encourage whatever speaks to you, the advocacy, when it hits my community or your community, I'm talking to the, to the folks watching, be a part of that. Be a part of the advocacy to uplift these voices. Because coming from me, it, it, it's just another black person saying this is something wrong, but our allies are the strength in that, you know, if it's coming, as we saw in the George Floyd case, it took those white cops to say this was wrong. And otherwise we would have not gotten justice, some form of justice. So you are our allies. You are the strength behind the change. And it can't be us against them, it has to be us collectively together to work towards this greater good. And it's not gonna be undone in one session, one, one Zoom, one election cycle. We have to be intentional about every aspect of these laws, every aspect of the people that we, we vote in and being intentional about voting and making sure we continue to do our work. It is never done. And that's my soapbox. I'm not as spicy as you, Heather, but I'll get there. <laughs> get him, sister. But I love you for it. And Christian, you are part of that journey. I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you, Thank you Hala. I'm going to pass it over to Clarissa. Clarissa, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, this is really fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> I um, everything that everyone has said, I, and I think we've touched on a lot of these points. Um, you know that that helps uplift these voices, and I think you know, especially within the structure of now, within our our state chapters and our local chapters, 
you know, really accepting the reality of this country's dynamics, right? Racism is everywhere. And what does it mean to be an ally? You know, white people, as a white person, I have immense white privilege. And an ally needs to be willing and ready and, and able to use their privilege to fight for and with those that are marginalized. I think, you know, we need to make sure that we are getting out the vote and talking about candidates that have a track record of ensuring that the most marginalized among us are heard and advocated for. When we, you know, Heather, I'm right there with you that it was so disappointing to see how many eligible Americans didn't vote in the 2020 election, where it felt like there was so much, I mean, there was so much on the line and every piece of it affected everyone in this country, right? But we can also look at why is it that people don't vote? What, you know, what is, what are the structures in place that disenfranchise people from voting and people from trusting that, that their vote matters, that their vote counts? Uh, you know, back to my, my thing on local elections, I know so many local races that have been decided by one vote. I know that every single vote matters and it's what we're doing when it's not six weeks before an election, right? What are we doing to ensure this, to move this movement forward? to show up as allies when it's, it's not about getting out the vote for the United States president. Because those are the moments when we really need to make sure that we are present and we are uplifting these voices. Something that you know I think a lot about, I think a lot about Breonna Taylor. And I think a lot about how that was a moment where we're in a moment in this country where we are so aware of and critical of uh, gun violence and the number of deaths and the number of people that have been murdered, especially black, black and brown people at the hands of the police and at the hands of gun violence. And, you know, but how many people are there that we don't know their names because mainstream media doesn't pick it up, right? And so in our, in our communities, in our now chapters across the country, it's so cool to see the chat blowing up with people from all over the country. And to seek out those organizations in your community that are run by, that are led by these, these people, that are ways that you can show up and be an ally to them. How can you use your voice? Um, and you know, I'm, I'm speaking largely as a white woman, uh, you know, that how can I use my voice to help the movement go forward, to bring these voices to the center, to uplift them, uh, to empower them, you know, how is it that we can really make sure that we're showing up at our state and local chapters and, and in our communities? Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, I mean, you brought up some really great points and that is, you know, showing up and uplifting the voices and narratives of those, uh, those people. And I think that's really important. So thank you so very much for that. Um, Heather. The importance of intersectionality in part is a moral question. It's the right thing to do. This country needs to represent all of our people. But the question of intersectionality is also a question of power. It's the way to win. And only if we organize for power based on our morality, based on our values, we lead with our values, but we say, what will it take to improve lives and to win? And so when we stop the pleading and start the organizing and build up our power, we then change this world. And Delegate Ayala, I love that dog. <laughs> I, I also, by the way, wanted to um, call out some wonderful people. There's so many, um, th there are many names I don't know yet and I would love to know in the chat. There are uh, well over or a hundred people and more in the chat. Um, but some of the names, Beth Corbin has been a lifetime uh, movement heroine uh, as has um, in fact, has been a hero in that hero of myth was a woman. Uh, also, Pat Roos, 
she has been the lobbyist for NOW and really in many ways, the Dean of Progressive Social Change and certainly feminist lobbyists uh, for, for a lifetime. Uh, and I saw David Sobelson here too, who's been a fighter on uh, women's rights and reproductive rights. Anyway, I'm not gonna go through the whole chat with more names, but it's wonderful to be in this crowd of uh, freedom fighters. Organizing to win. Yes. That's the, that's the key. And people are power, right? <laughs> Thank you, Heather. And Kristen. Kristen, you're still oh, muted. Wait. Oh, sorry, what was that? I've totally oh. got caught up in Heather's. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, it's okay. I was asking you to share your perspective. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, on intersectionality. On intersectionality. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So basically, um, in my culture, and really just in the indigenous culture, we all recognize that we are, oh, there's a hummingbird. Sorry. Anyway, ADHD brain. Um, we are all connected. We are all related. Um, much like the body, if something happens to one area, like, you know, it affects the whole, the whole being. So intersectionality, there is no revolution without intersectionality. There just, there just isn't. Um, so I believe that the, the, in order to get um, communities more centered really is to just keep reaching out. We have so much technology right now like I, okay, so during COVID, I had nothing to do. I was like, what am I going to do to fill my time? And I ended up joining TikTok. And <laughs> I know a little crazy, but I have met so many activists, so many people, like so many allies, so many people who just truly care. And they aren't part of an organization. They're not, uh, you know, signed up. They're not now members. They're just regular people who just care. And I'm like, y'all got to sign up. Like we have so many organizations, but there are so many different ways to be an activist right now. And social activism is really on the rise. And I know some people think that, oh, it's just uh, social justice warriors, keyboard warriors, but it's like these people, uh, TikTok, they, these kids, they were the ones who bought out all of the seats for Trump's rally and then nobody showed up. Remember that? Like, that was amazing. And, and these were just TikTokers, like just regular people. So I feel like um, if like, I know Austin now we have a TikTok, but if more people could get online and um, just really embrace social media, we can really connect to everybody and really understand like all of the issues that we thought we knew or issues that we've never even heard of. Um, I have made allies with indigenous people all over the world, not just here in North America, like all over the world because of TikTok. So I don't know, I'm just, I'm a big um, advocate for connecting with people online. Um, there's more access, people, um, you know, people who are unable to always be out and about, they're online. You know, like we, we exist, we're still here. We're, uh, there's so many people that do care and they just don't know what to do exactly except say their opinion online. So I think if we keep uh, reaching out and make sure to include uh, like social media, all social media um, besides Facebook, let's be honest. Um, I think that we can really make a difference, you know? Kristen, but you got to remember some of us Gen Xers still use Facebook. I keep us so Gen Xers in there. That's Next thing, we're going to get kicked off of Facebook, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> so if we could just make Facebook better, like maybe end the lies on Facebook, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> then, then I would be okay with it. If Mark Zuckerberg can get his... But, but but I do but I do just see your point, Kristen, and that is that we have to part of our work now is to be able to connect with everyone 
we have a multi-generational approach to how we connect and an intergenerational approach, a multiracial approach and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and an intersectional approach to how we connect with membership and individuals to let them know the work that we're doing, let them know what our grassroots is doing. So this brings me to my final question and then we're gonna take a couple questions um, from, from our uh, participants. But tell me, I would like to hear from you all something that you're very proud of that you've done um, as being a part of now or as just as, a, as an activist, as a leader and what is something that you would like to encourage um, as we're moving forward in this new generation, we're saying now what, right? So when we think about now what, we moving forward an intersect, an intersectional, um, you know, our intersectional agenda, intersectional feminists, tell us one thing you recommend for now to help us move forward with our intersectional feminist agenda. So first I'd like you to tell me something you're proud of as the activist, the feminist and the activist, and then something you feel will be great for us as we move forward, um, as, as, you, as you being a part of now, that you think will be great for us, um, as you your knowledge, that would be great, that you would like to share and give. Those are your final words. And anyone can go out, open up to whoever would like to share first. Can you repeat the question? Okay, so it's a two-part question. The first part of the question is, tell us something you're proud of uh, that you've accomplished as a feminist or as a feminist activist. Um, and the second part of the question is like, what is your takeaway or something you would like to encourage, you know, as we move forward um, with our intersectional feminist agenda? Okay, um, so, Oh, I'm so proud of so many things. I feel like we've done a lot for just being like, I've only been in um, now for a year and a half. So I'm, I'm still pretty new, but I feel like we've done so much. There's so much to be proud of. But um, uh, personally, I feel like um, the fact that we've really kind of bent our rules a little bit where we don't, um, we're not so strict with like, you have to wait a few months to become an officer, uh, things like that, you know, um, like you can sign up and maybe pay once you're able to, even though you're still doing, you know, you're still participating. Um, that has really helped my organization. We have been able to find people or find activists who um, are really passionate and able to uh, perform right away and not all, not all the time are they able to like pay right away or uh, um, or like uh, instead of asking people to because there's a two-month wait period uh, before having somebody become an officer just so that we can know each other instead I kind of almost did like a hiring thing where I kind of just interviewed a bunch of people and was like you know testing the waters to see um you know, how these people are. And uh, it helped greatly. I was able to really uh, understand like who is actually willing to put in the time and who isn't, like who wants to, but you know, just because you want to be here doesn't mean you're able to. So I was able to like weed through people and find um, these amazing team members who are now like Alexia is my vice president. She's been here for just a few months, you know, and already she has done so much for our organization. And uh, all of us are just really close and we've, ah, oh, I'm just, I'm proud of all of us. <laughs> but um, yeah, we understand uh, solidarity, true solidarity. We understand intersectional feminism. We're not all about one issue. We realize that we're about all of the issues and that um, everything is connected. Everything is related. So you can't care about one issue and not care about the other. Like it all connects. So um, I'm very proud that I have collected a group of intersectional feminists and that we collectively are working to um, stay intersectional. Um, personally, uh, because of the um, 
because of some of the events that um, I have experienced here while moving to Texas, I ended up having an unhealthy pregnancy. Um, even though it was planned, I didn't plan for it to be unhealthy. Um, so I went through just about literally every anti-abortion care law here in the state, which was really hard. Um, I only had four days to pay out of pocket because even though this was for medical reason, which they say in the laws here that, oh, if it's a medical reason, that's okay, you get a pass. No, I did not get a pass. I had four days to pay $2,700 to save my life. I don't know anybody my age that can do that, okay? Like that was insane. Um, and then to know that the bills that they're creating right now. So I ended up having to have an abortion at uh, 21 weeks, and like five days. So it was like two days before the cutoff. Now they're trying to make uh, a rule where you can't have an abortion after 12 weeks. I didn't even have my first, uh, my first pregnancy um, doctor appointment until week 13. They told me not to come. They're like, oh, wait two more weeks and then you can come in. And that's kind of the, the uh, just how it is down here. And so I'm very proud that I was able to, um, like I had the privilege to ask my family for help and they were able to pay for my health care. Um, and ever since then, I have really just made it my mission to spread my story and spread everybody's uh, stories who have experience what I have, um, especially here in Texas and the other uh, states around that, like, um, oh, what was it, Ohio, if you have a miscarriage, they will interview you and try to see if it was abortion or if it really was a miscarriage. And if they think it was abortion care, they'll arrest you for it. And that it's not the only state that does that. <sighs> so I'm very proud of myself that I have stuck to sharing my story and I have been able to connect with other people like shout your abortion. If you go um, to any social media and do hashtag shout your abortion, you'll find all of these abortion stories created from this organization. I have also connected with a woman in Canada who has made it her mission to share um, virtual reality stories. So um, I was able to like get hooked in and uh, tell my story and now people will be able to put on these goggles and see me and feel like they're right there talking to me about what happened and and she's in Canada so this is like a, a worldwide uh, solidarity project that I've been working on and I've also linked up with pro-choice with heart they're also on social media they do a lot of advocacy work um, and I'm trying to see if, you know, Austin now and Pro-Choice with Heart can uh, work together. So, yeah, I'm just really proud that um, we're all working together and that I didn't let things get down or get me down or keep me down. Um, so it's really hard. I mean, I, I was like, am I going to die in Texas? Like, is very unique experience. Thank you so much for just sharing that with us and uh, just being vulnerable to share that with us. We appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, it's a very I moving story. Uh, moved all of us. There are many comments in the chat. I, I, I give you a virtual hug since we are not in the same room together, but I hope you feel the embrace by all of us. Thank you. Some of you may know that in my own background in 1965, when I was a student, uh, another woman student was pregnant and nearly suicidal and was not ready to have an abortion, uh, not ready to have a child and was looking for an abortion. And I was a junior then in college and hadn't really thought about the issue before. 
and feeling that there was a moral need to help someone in need, I reached out to the Medical Committee for Human Rights, which was the medical arm of the civil rights movement and found a doctor for her, Dr. T.R.M. Howard, who had been, it turns out, a great civil rights leader in Mississippi until his name appeared on a Klan death list and he moved to Chicago and set up what I only found out later was Friendship Clinic, uh, a, a women's clinic. He performed the abortion. I didn't think much more about it. This was 1965, years before Roe in 1973. The procedure was successful. I wasn't talking to anyone about it, but word spread. Someone else called me a little later. I set up that abortion and word spread. And I decided I needed to set up a system. We call the system Jane. And over time, the women that I recruited and others then recruited into Jane themselves learned how to provide and performed 11,000 abortions between 1965 and 1973, when Roe became the law of the land, when three people talking about abortion would have been a conspiracy to commit a felony. We have changed the law because we organized. We can never go back to those days. We need to keep abortion and women's health and women's full participation in the society safe and legal and support women in our choices. Kristen, I feel the pain you describe deeply and embrace you as a sister in this movement. To, to move to Christian's question, something we're proud of. There's so many things to be proud of. I'm mostly proud of us, of being one of us. I'm proud of today's session. I'm proud of the last week's session. I'm proud of the fights that we're in now and what we'll be in on in the future. And my real uh, hope for NOW, as Christian asked, I come back if these are our parting comments before the questions, is I remember, remind you what I shared before, that we need to function with love at the center. So many of us feel we're not good enough. We don't know enough. Oh, that person's smart. I'm not that smart. I'm not that pretty. I'm not that thin. I'm not that fat. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not good enough. But we are good enough and we need to support each other with love at the center and to organize. And so I'm mostly proud of NOW and glad to be a member and your sister. Thank you. Teresa? Yeah, um, thank you so much for sharing that, Kristen, and, and echoing all the support and love in the chat. Um, it's absolutely, you're incredible. Um, and, and thank you so much. Um, in terms of the question, what I'm most proud of, um, I, I will say that living in rural Wisconsin for a year was quite an interesting experience. Um, and, you know, I think what I'm most proud of is, is the volunteers that I got to build such deep relationships with. Um, it was fun. Wisconsin had an election earlier this month and at the local level, there were city council seats up. Uh, you know, and my volunteers are from there are still volunteering and they called me because I was on their volunteer recruitment phone bank list. So they gave me a call to see if I'd make calls, um, which was just absolutely wonderful. Um, and, and, you know, because of the fact that, you know, we were phone banking, I pretty much if, if you knew me in the year 2020, I asked you to volunteer <laughs> uh, is what happened. And, um, and it was it was really incredible to see people I went to high school with and my college friends, parents and my college friends themselves jumping on phone banks with me every week to make sure Wisconsin turned blue. Uh, that was a really exciting moment to be a part of. Um, in terms of getting involved in now um, and just kind of where we go from here, 
Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Christine Shin Ryan, who is our president of Oregon now, and just an absolute, um, I don't want to, I don't want to cuss on a Zoom, but uh, just incredible, incredible. <laughs> um, and one of the things that, that she has been doing um, that I'm so proud to be a part of is, is exactly what we're talking about here tonight is how you know making sure that we are as inclusive as can be that we are uplifting the voices uh, that need us to to be allies for to make sure that that those are the people that are at the center of the conversation and, and leading the charge uh, she has just absolutely made a, an active commitment to diversifying um, and really you know make leading our state chapter in the direction that we need to be headed in. Uh, and I am just absolutely honored to be a part of that and to know her and learn from her. So um, I hope every state has a Christine Chin Ryan because she is just amazing. <laughs> and Hala. Yeah, I don't remember the question. So I'll just ad lib here. <laughs> you know, I think the, you know, hugs to you, Kristen and Heather and Clarissa for just being a part and creating space for us to be authentic. And Christian, thank you for doing that, allowing us the space. When we become allies, whether it's for an issue or for a diverse group of individuals or trying to, the best question is, and I think Clarissa asked it, how? Not telling us what we need to do or how to do it, but how we can do it. And I think that starts with what Heather said, love, being self-aware and organizing and being sensitive and taking people where they are and, and, and let's not cancel their voices or erase their voices because they don't sound like us or think like us, or maybe they haven't gotten this close to the issue yet and have yet been informed. I think we have to look at it in its totality of evolution. You take people where they are and empower them with the education and voices because not everybody, we know our own personal journeys as now sisters we know the tough times or the lived experiences that we have, and not everybody has them. And not everybody is, is self-aware or not everything that they say may be accurate or right or do is accurate or right. This is why now has always created a space for, for us to be authentically us. And we as sisters need to pass that baton, not only to foster and nurture our involvement and engagement and organizing, but giving us space to learn and to, to figure it out, right? And it's not a perfect product, right? We're not perfection. When I was enlisted in now, I thought because I was a diverse individual that I wasn't heard or seen, not because if anything anybody said or did, but it's just because of my lived experience. And to share that and to explain that, I was given that space. And they, and, and then in return, I made the most wonderful friends and supporters. And they taught me these skills, these hell raising skills. I'm going to cuss for you, Clarissa, you know, or Kristen, and just say, look, you know, it takes a village. And if we're going to unite voices fighting for the very issues that we, we were done, even in my, in, in my state and in general assembly, we have to be organized, not just in numbers, but taking individuals where they are, recruiting, being a part of this activism and helping foster, you know, self-awareness or awareness of, of any platform or issue. Um, you know, I wasn't, I didn't come into this world born with a book on how to be a woman, <laughs> you know, or a parent or anything else. And th through wisdom, through these lived experiences, we take people where they are and we, 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 we create those allies, right? And, and I just want us to all know that I have been given that opportunity and I would not be here if it wasn't for women like you. And, and, and I think that as y'all are creating these steps of intersectional conversations and issues and advocacy, so on and so forth, um, now and as is other platforms, uh, need to be intentional by diversifying those voices and making sure that everyone has a seat at the table and that we're not, we're, we're not going to be able to achieve this if we don't have all of those voices 
being welcome into a welcome space. Um, I remember people were like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, educate me. That is beautiful. I know we called it conscious raising, you know, some decades ago, but this is part of that, you know, making us self-aware. I think what I'm most proud of is being affiliated with now and being able to pass the ERA and Medicaid expansion and some of the pro-choice, pro-women, pro-family pro everybody wins when we put women at the table and good governance and policies unfold. And you've given me the tools to do that. So I think that I want to uplift you, Christian, and just say, thank you for leading it. I can't be what I can't see. And now I can see. And this is the beauty of this unfolding as we evolve as individuals. I think that each one of my sisters on this call has a part and a role in all of our journeys and all of our voices and all of our advocacies and keep fighting the good fight. Keep remembering every day you may not win, but you may make progress and that is to a win. And so with that, thank you for having me, Christian. Thank you for letting me be a part of these wonderful, amazing trailblazers, both numerically mature and you know, not numerically mature, if you will. I'm trying to be Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. So, thank you so much uh, to Hala. Thank you to all the panelists, Hala, Clarissa, Heather, Kristen. Um, thank you to the wonderful NACT who are, is just fabulous. I mean, you all even know how fabulous my team is, but <laughs> our team is just they are fabulous. Um, thank you to all participants who came out tonight. We are over time. So unfortunately, um, we're going to have to cap it because we are going to get cut off by Zoom webinar <laughs> and we don't want to hold anyone else too much longer. But I just thank everyone for sharing their, their wisdom, their knowledge, their expertise, um, their story, their narratives, um, and just their motivation and just their encouragement. Uh, it's just been, this has just been wonderful. I thank you all for being authentic. I thank you all for being vulnerable in moments. Um, it is, this is important. I think it's important for us to see this and see that we can be or um, authentic, we can be vulnerable. Um, and we still can remain strong in all of this. And we're human, right? Even in this fight, even as advocates, as activists, we're still human and we're beautiful in all the complexities that we are. Um, so I thank you all. Um, I wish you all a wonderful evening. And please, everyone, look out now.org, www.now.org for upcoming events um, and for future things um, that will be happening. You all have a pleasant evening. Thank you.